Hello, everyone. Simon Jacobson here. I welcome you all. And I have for you a very interesting uh, and hopefully very enlightening conversation, um, which may surprise some of you. So uh, let me get right to it. As you know, I've been talking about many different angles and aspects since this war broke out, the atrocities on October 7th in the Hebrew calendar, Simchat Torah. And um, one of the things that I did was just a few days ago, I shared some words from my heart and hopefully words from the heart enter the heart to my Muslim cousins and friends about what Abraham, our great grandfather Abraham, would say about all of this. And as a result, I received actually a response from a Muslim friend and cousin by the name of, and I'm going to introduce him shortly, Hassan Ali Imam. And uh, we are here now as my special guest, and we're going to have a conversation about all the events that are going on. I thought it to be fascinating to have a conversation between a Jew like myself, a Muslim, and uh, talk about Abraham and talk about all these experiences, including some of it is quite painful, but hopefully we can come away with something that can enrich and empower us all in these challenging times. Look, the bottom line goal is peace. The bottom line goal is shalom in Hebrew, salam in in uh, in Arabic, idea that there's <coughs> harmony within diversity. And I think the only way to do that is when we put our heads together, we put our egos aside, we put our interests and our biases and prejudices and try to live up what God wants of all of us. We're all God's children, and we're all children of Abraham. So that's the objective here. So I welcome you, Hassan Ali Imam. Thank you for being here. I will give his biography in a moment, but first I wanted to welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Rabbi. Uh, shalom Alaikum and Assalamu Alaikum to, to your listeners. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and pleasure. So let me give a short bi bio, and I'll also give a bio of myself so uh, those listening will get a sense of who is speaking to them. So Hassan Ali Imam was born in Bangladesh, in 1972, and brought up in the UK. He has engaged in respectful debate and dialogue with those which disagree with him, which culminated in his candidacy for the British Parliament in 2005. He continues to be involved with the UK Conservative Party. He's a regular caller to LBC Radio in UK. Hassan has also been involved with the UK government's prevent counter-terrorism strategy as a trainer to public servants on how to prevent young people from venturing into extremism. He also draws on his own experience of attempted recruitment by extremist groups in the 1990s. Hassan has authored three books, United States of Anger, Bain Breaking Through Barriers, Asia, and Fatima. Hassan has also written an article on medium.com to challenge the anti-vaccine narrative from his own conservative side, including Dr. Simone Gold in the U.S., and has invited dialogue and debate with anti-vaxxers. He has engaged with feminists and the pro-choice advocates in relation to abortion. He has also engaged in dialogue with an Israeli Jew and an anti-Israeli Muslim on the state of Israel and the importance of Jews, Christians, and Muslims to unite under the Abrahamic Brotherhood. Okay, so welcome again, Hassan. It's an honor, and I really feel that uh, our conversation, our dialogue, which um, has not been scripted for the record, will uh, be extremely illuminating, especially in these dark times. Just to give a little sense of myself, I'm Simon Jacobson. Some of you may be aware of me, some of you may not be. I'm based in uh, Brooklyn, New York, where I grew up. I am obviously Jewish, um, a grandson of Abraham, yes, as, uh, as you are, Hassan. And um, proud, a proud Jew, and feel the in the need. I think this is a historic time, maybe the definitive event of our of our lifetimes, to stand up and not be silent and to speak up. And that for that, I commend you, Hassan, to join me here to speak up about everything, from the atrocities to different viewpoints, suggestions of how we can actually create 
a real brotherhood, a real sisterhood of unity. And that's exactly what our objective is, that despite our diversity, despite our different faiths, religions, backgrounds, language, whatever it may be, we still are all part of one larger mosaic, a cosmic uh, musical composition is the way I like to put it. However, we cannot ignore the painful and difficult uh, events that have happened the last few uh, weeks. So with that, let me begin. Where were you October 7th? Since it's not obviously not the beginning of the story, but beginning of this chapter at least, where were you in your reaction? Let's just start with that, if I may. Thank you very much indeed for the uh, kind introduction, Rabbi. And uh, the privilege is actually all mine. Um, so it is an absolute pleasure. And you're absolutely right. Um, uh, this is about peace and, and, and brotherhood, sisterhood under uh, our, our common prophets, uh, Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael. So I hope that uh, we are going to have an enlightening conversation and we certainly want to take our, our, your, your listeners, be they Jews, Christians, Muslims, people of other faiths, to a much better place and be truly inspired so that they can do something that will enable peace to, to happen. So Rabbi, to, to answer your question as to what I was doing on the 7th of October, I was actually preparing uh, for our journey to um, Mecca and Medina, to Saudi Arabia which we went a few days later for the minor pilgrimage known as the Umrah in, in, in Arabic. And um, <clears throat> when I um, uh, heard the news uh, of the uh, rockets being fired and a very sophisticated uh, operation uh, be, being unleashed, uh, the paragliders, the drones, and I thought to myself, this is a very sophisticated o operation. There must have been some uh, foreign backing. And as the news was coming out of um, innocent uh, people in Israel being uh, killed, uh, kidnapped, and some very, very harrowing stories, uh, you know, of, of uh, families being burnt, uh, babies, <clears throat> etc. I thought to myself, um, you know, the, the, this is uh, an act of terrorism. Why did our brothers, you know, uh, who are meant to be our brothers, Hamas, do this? Um, because... And I've been dealing with extremism over the last 30 years. As you said in the introduction, Rabbi, that there was uh, attempted recruitment. I did try to engage uh, with uh, extremist groups in the, in the UK. <clears throat> and what is quite common about, uh, with these groups, <clears throat> extremist groups, is they, they have the garb of religion, but they do break uh, our Islamic laws. And this is something that has not come out in the various media interviews I've, I've uh, heard. Okay, so maybe if you'd allow me, Rabbi, during our conversation, I'll actually show, um, share what uh, the Prophet actually said about warfare and civilians. So they broke the rules about killing uh, innocent civilians. So they broke Sharia law on that. And uh, secondly, as soon as I heard those news, I thought I, I was, you know, pained uh, what happened to the civilians in Israel. Immediately, literally within a few seconds, I thought, oh, no, what does that mean for the civilians in Gaza? What's going to happen to them? You know, because what has been uh, quite consistent after Hamas um, rocket attacks is that Israel, the IDF, have hit back 10 times as hard. And I was thinking, well, Hamas actually knew this. And I texted uh, one of my Palestinian friends what is going on here? Why did Hamas actually do this, knowing, and we can obviously talk about the rights and wrongs of the retaliation, why did they do this? Because civilian lives, especially children, are going to die. They knew what the outcome was, so why did they do this? So I think I may have an answer uh, to that. Um, so that was what was going through my uh, mind. And a few weeks later, uh, when the retaliation happened, yes, what my fear was, it is turn out, turning out to be a, a real nightmare. Why do you think? What would be your, uh, what's your theory? As to why Hamas did it? I think um, when I watch the picture of uh, the uh, Hamas leadership um, uh, praying, you know, they, they, uh, there was a scene of them uh, praying, I think they probably thought they'd uh, gather uh, all of the Muslim world together and, and uh, uh, attack Israel. Um, but still, why would they want to sacrifice uh, civilians? Um, so I think an answer, I don't know if it's an exact answer, 
but I did watch an interview of Khalid Mashal on Al Arabiya TV, who was asked the question about the impact on the civilians. And he cited the analogies of other communities that have lost lives. So Russia lost about uh, 6 million uh, people uh, fighting the Nazis or uh, tens of millions of people fighting the Nazis. Uh, Afghanistan lost uh, 6 million people over 130 years. Um, Vietnam lost 3.5 million people to fight America. So as he was churning those figures, he was talking talk about sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. And I thought to myself, okay, so you are probably wanting to sacrifice your civilians, but why? Because it is your duty to protect civilians. Okay, that, that is also under Islamic law. You don't kill uh, civilians, you know, uh, Israeli civilians. It's your duty to protect your own civilians. So you've broken Islamic law again. So I still don't have an answer to the question, really. It's just theories. I hear you, Hassan. So let me ask you this. I mean, a very blunt question. You're clearly a Muslim. You're familiar with the, the Quran. You're familiar with Muslim teachings. And I would definitely want to hear some of the sources of how this is a crime against the very religion of Islam. But how is it possible that a uh, that Islam should spawn? You know, I understand there are always bad actors out there. But here they're doing it in the name of religion. And it's not one or two people. How is it possible that should spawn such type of behavior that goes against the very faith and the very beliefs that um, that you believe in, that uh, Muslims believe in? It seems like, you know, it's one thing a bunch of criminals get together and they decide they want to murder whatever, for territory, for land, for, for money, for power. How do you, how do you not justify it, obviously? Because you can't justify such behavior. But how do you even begin to wrap your head around that? Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to wrap my head over the last uh, 30 years. Um, I know how the uh, different people, how, how the uh, terrorists would, would recruit uh, um, impressionable Muslims. So one example was uh, when I was at university in the early 90s uh, at the London School of Economics. Uh, one of my friends, uh, he was such a lovely guy. Uh, he couldn't hurt a fly. But then when he went to Bosnia, he saw the carnage there, you know, uh, what the Serbians did to, to the Muslims and the genocide. And point to be noted, Israel did actually help to take in some of the Bosnian families. Um, and um, when it, he saw complete uh, devastation there, and, and he was very frustrated because many Muslim governments uh, were not doing much. So he decided that he's going to join the Mujahideen um, and jo join a, a terror group, have training in Afghanistan. And he invited me to, to join uh, him as well with, uh, with the training. And uh, I found out and then realized how um, extremists do try to recruit people uh, w where we may be vulnerable. We, we see injustices happening you know, in, in, in the Muslim world and many governments not doing anything. But yes, you can do something. Join this group, get trained, and you can make a difference. So they exploit the vulnerabilities uh, of them. Now, as to why um, they do this, knowing what the religion actually says, uh, I don't know. Um, I, in 2005, when I stood for parliament, uh, there was an extremist group um, that uh, sort of had me and some other Muslims who were stood for parliament uh, as, uh, on the mugshots on their website. Um, they didn't like the fact that we were standing for parliament. So I challenged them to a debate. So the best way to handle these extremists is to engage them in a uh, a debate, expose them. And uh, but the topic um, I wanted to debate was uh, the 9 11 attacks. It was that justifiable, uh, etc. And you may have heard uh, that uh, organization was led by Omar Bakri Mohammed. He was very well known here in the UK and I think he was kicked out. So I wanted to um, uh, um, in engage with him. Um, one week before the debate was due to take place, uh, uh, well, one of his representatives called me and said, uh, no, they don't want a public debate because they didn't want uh, people to see Muslims arguing in public. So suddenly I become a Muslim after they call me a non-Muslim. You know? um, so it shows, it shows that they do not have legs to stand on. When you try to engage with them, you talk about religion, um, you know, they, they, they will actually fall down. That's how we, we, you know, we try to defeat uh, extremism.
Did you ever feel that you were in danger? No, no. Um, I mean, my, my wife is telling me, well, why, why are you doing all of these? Uh, you know, you have a family. But there is a way of... Um, uh, I've, I've never had any threats, no, luckily, luckily. Uh, because what I try to do, yes, uh, I'll, I'll condemn, I'll call out an injustice when I see it, but let's try and find ways to to unite, you know, find commonalities between different communities. So this message of peace, hope, brotherhood, um, hopefully th that should find a home in, in all, all communities. So hopefully the threats uh, should be uh, mitigated. But, you know, in my last 30 years I've been in, engaging, I haven't had any threats. Have you had any threats, Rabbi? No, I have not. Um, but in a way, I mean, I mean, I could see them in their own uh, obscene and distorted view. I see you as an enemy, not just that you're looking for a peaceful solution. That you go and condemn them. You know, I've read some of what you've written, what you've mm. said. That's why I was wondering. Um, let me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, uh, no. Luckily, I haven't. I think if if you hold on to what, what you believe in, in terms of the religion, you know, you have complete faith in God, then nothing can 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 harm you. You know, that's, that's, that's my belief. I'm very glad to hear that. That's great. That's where that's exactly. So let me ask you, why why, why do you feel you weren't vulnerable and impressionable to these uh, attempts to recruit? And others are. Is there something, is there a secret immunity formula that you have? I'm just wondering how... <laughs> It works. Well, what really put me off uh, from that attempted recruitment by this guy I talked about, his name is Ahmed Omar Sheikh. He was uh, jailed and he was well known actually for being involved with the murder of the American journalist, uh, the Jewish journalist, uh, Daniel Pearl. So that was him. <laughs> um, so w w the things he was saying re really did not uh, gel. So when he said that, um, was talking about the the war against the Soviet Union, uh, the Mujahideen war against the Soviet Union. He said that uh, Islam won that war, which it didn't because it was American-made Stinger missiles that won that war. Okay, it wasn't Islam. Um, and soon after the war ended, he had the different Mujahideen factions fighting amongst themselves, and that is not a a, a view, you know, what circumstances of what a Muslim, uh, you know, jihad would, would look like. Um, he also said uh, that uh, go, you can go for training in Afghanistan, you don't have to join, okay, um, but uh, just tell your parents, uh, you, you can lie to your parents, okay, that you're just going on holiday, etc. And I thought to myself, hang on a minute, in, in Islam, um, after, you know, um, the love for the Prophet, your parents are next, you know, obeying your parents, respecting your parents, and to lie to your parents about something like this, that, that that's a no-go. That's what uh, put me off. But I think uh, the ultimate formula, Rabbi, uh, to answer your question is is the Quran and, and the Sunnah, the, the way of the Prophet. That's the antidote. I understand. So, so why do you think there are so many vulnerable, young, impressionable Muslims that are being recruited? Like, what, what are they missing? I think it's probably uh, more, so it's more of the, the emotional thing. So when they see... Uh, injustices taking place uh, around the world. So obviously, yeah. we've had the you know Israel and that has not now. affected you. That has not affected you, or you're able to separate between the two, basically. Yeah, I was. I, I mean, I, obviously, I I understand uh, the, the various uh, injustices that have taken place. You think? Uh, do you think your education, your parents, your family had had much to do with it? In other words, yes. I mean, my, my yeah, uh, my father said, you know, never going to extremes. So he he did say that. Um, and as I looked further into uh, the Quran and, and, and the Hadith, then I thought, no, this, this can't be right. And the fact that when I've challenged extremists about what they do and they've backed down, it shows that, no, we, we are on the right path. The majority of Muslims, you know, are the, although the extremists are small in number, they have a very, very big impact, unfortunately. And that's why we have people, certainly on those on the far right, white supremacists, who think that... Uh, it is Islam, that's the problem, you know, and they would pick out some of the sort of apparent violent verses in the Quran and say, look, you know, uh, the, these Muslims, they, they might appear to be very friendly like I am now, but they'll say, oh, this is takia, you know, they're, they're practicing secrecy, they're really trying to undermine Western society, which uh, they're not. So the majority of Muslims would adhere, it is the minor extremists, I think it, it, they're driven by the, the emotional 
impact or the injustices uh, that we see around the world. So do you think that the Muslim countries are condemning it the way they should? Because based on what you're saying, the majority feel that way. Why don't you hear louder condemnations? Do you have any comment on that? Condemnation of the uh, Hamas attacks, was it? Yeah, yes. Um, I, I think some uh, countries had um, condemned it. And I know Saudi Arabia, one of the foreign ministers, really uh, condemned it because it goes against Islam and you know Muslims should not be afraid. This is what Islam says, this is what they, they've done. Those very same people had condemned ISIS and Al-Qaeda, Islamic Jihad, but I did find there's some resistance to try and condemn Hamas when there are some of them, the commentators, the pro-Palestinian activists are asked uh, to condemn Hamas. Uh, there's some hesitation, and it might be because um, they're going to be killed, you know, if they were to so say... There, there is fear of uh, repri reprisals and so on. I, I, I think so. So when the Palestinian ambassador here in the UK, Hussam Zomlot, said that he was asked about Hamas, and he, and he said... You know, we are the Palestinian Authority, you know, majority of Palestinians uh, support us. Then I'll say, well, act like you're the authority. Why letting Hamas drive the narrative? Um, but some, um, I'm finding that more and more Muslims are coming out. Um, when I listen to the radio on TV that uh, to, to uh, condemn Hamas um, and also what's happening now in, in, in Gaza with the innocent people that are being affected. Uh, but slowly, I think they are coming uh, to the fore. You know, I'll, I'll just quote one of your quotes in your letter. Um, Hassan wrote a letter, public letter to his Muslim friends, which I have here right here. Um, and a Muslim's open letter to Hamas, very c condemning, very uh, the certain tongue-in-cheek but sharp condemnation. So one of the things you quote is from the prophet, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. This is the advice he gave to real warriors. Not fake warriors of Hamas wearing fake Gucci shirts. Quote, you will find the people who claim to have totally given themselves to God. Leave them to what they claim to have given themselves. Do not kill women or children or an aged infirm person. Do not cut down fruit bearing trees. Do not destroy an inhabited place. Do not slaughter sheep or camels except for food. And you continue um, in the, what you do, do nots. Malik ibn Anas. I'm sure you're familiar. You quoted it. You yeah. were going to mention before, you said you were going to use a few quotes. I'd like to hear, I think the audience needs to hear, because people don't really know, in many cases, what Muslims really believe. What does it really say in the doctrine? Um, and no, I think it's, it's vital to set the record straight. So would you like to comment? Yeah, thank you, Rabbi, for the opportunity. And what you just quoted from Abu Bakr, I can probably guarantee you that your listeners and people around the world have not actually heard of this. <laughs> and there's so many commentators, you know, might be Muslims, uh, pro-Palestinian, they haven't quoted this. The only time I did hear something like this being quoted um, uh, was by an American military general, believe it or not. A decade ago on CNN, so they knew what Islam actually says. So, the, so you quoted from Abu Bakr, the first caliph after Muhammad, uh, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad also said, uh, "Do not cause harm, nor return harm." Um, and also, he, he had an inscription on his sword, uh, which said, "Verily, the worst of people in insolence are those who strike at whoever did not strike them. A man who kills those who did not fight him." And there is a a verse in the Quran, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, uh, which says, uh, O you who believe, now this is quite crucial here, and I, I want more Muslims to, to, uh, to uh, quote this during interviews. O you who believe, stand out firmly for God as witnesses to fair dealing, and let not the hatred of others to you make you swerve to wrong and depart from justice. Be just. That is next to piety and fear God, for God is well acquainted with all that you do. Um, that's, uh, and, you know, uh, chances are that your listeners have not heard of these. No. Uh, I, I hope all Muslims have heard, because I'll be honest, when I read some of these texts that you've quoted and you've just read as well, um, I would be, if I was a Muslim, I'd be furious. I'd be 
absolutely that some people are trying to hijack my religion. I am Jewish. I read in the Bible exactly the similar words. Do not kill innocent people. Do not kill anyone. And even if it's self-defense, you also have to be civil and so on. You know, I was reading here, you wrote as well, you quoted Article 3 of the Cairo Declaration. In the event of the use of force and in case of armed conflict, it is not permissible to kill non-belligerents, such as old men, women, and children. The wounded and the sick shall have the right to medical treatment, and prisoners of war shall have the right to be fed, sheltered, and clothed. It is prohibit, prohibited to mutilate dead bodies. So when I read this, I it makes my blood beyond boil, because it's one thing, the atrocities, but literally it's defiling and desecrating what Islam stands for. So I'm just being very blunt when I read this, so then I say, so why is there not an uproar? If the majority of the Muslim world believes this, they should say these people are criminals. They're hijacking. Now, I could only trans the only way I could justify why they don't do it is either fair, as you put it, or maybe that maybe the, the I guess the hatred or uh, of Israel and the Jews is stronger than their love of these doctrines. I'm just thinking out loud here. So uh, please comment. Please respond. Yeah. Um... I, I I don't know. It's um, I suppose it uh, goes back to what I was saying earlier on that some of those uh, people uh, had openly condemned ISIS and Al Qaeda, Islamic Jihad, Boko Haram, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for going against our religion. With Hamas, it's been uh, very very slow um, to to condemn. It's probably because uh, they've fused themselves with the Palestinian cause, which which is a genuine cause to get a Palestinian state that would live side by side. With Israel, and because they've been mashed together, um, that's uh, that's probably why it is hard to condemn Hamas because they've been integrated now, un unfortunately. And what is very unfortunate now is that people who want to fly the flag of Palestine uh, in the West and the UK, uh, there's a perception now that they support Hamas, um, and this is a problem that we had in the UK about 40 years ago. So you see the British flag behind me. The, the far right, uh, the racist, white supremacists, they owned that flag, okay? So whenever people used to see that, oh, that's race, white racism, luckily, this belongs to us, okay? The Palestinian flag has to be claimed back, you know, to the, back by the Palestinians. Uh, there is a genuine cause. Not, not only had Hamas, uh, you know, killed innocent Israelis and the blowback on innocent Palestinian, which is absolutely devastating, they've blown the Palestinian cause as well, a genuine cause. Um, and I hope that with our discussion, with the call for unity, Abrahamic Brotherhood, that, that we can, you know, make a difference uh, in, in some way. Um, but I want to reassure uh, Jews as well in the, in the UK, because what I've heard on, on in the media that some uh, the Jews are frightened, um, I want to assure them that for every extremist that might want to harm them, there'll be 100 Muslims that will save them, okay? There was one lady who rang into the radio station and said uh, she wants to leave England and go to Israel because she'll feel protected. And I feel very sad because no one should have to leave the UK for this threat. Um, and I think uh, Muslims should shout louder now and provide the reassurance, as I, as I did a good few times over the last 20 years after various terrorist attacks, that, you know, we Muslims, we, you know, we, we will protect you. And let's not forget hundreds of years of history really good history between Jews and Muslims when Jews were kicked out. Muslims were, were kicked out of Spain in 1492. And where did they seek refuge? It was the Muslim lands. Uh, and we need to rekindle that brotherhood that we had. The issue with uh, using civilians as human shields, how's that looked upon by yourself and by other Muslims? I mean, because that becomes a major issue because civilians are being killed in any war, there are going to be some civilians killed. But if Hamas is indeed using and embedding themselves amidst hospitals and schools and civilians, their own civilians, I'm not talking about J J Jewish, Israeli ones, what are you? what's your thoughts on that? Well, my, my, my thought was uh, the thought that I had when I texted my uh, Palestinian friend, what is Hamas doing? You know, They know the impact it's going to have on their civilians. And it is a duty to protect the civilians. Um, I mean, Israel, uh, the reason why 
you don't see that many casualties apart from October the 7th before then uh, from missiles is because of the Iron Dome bomb shelters that the government has provided for Israelis, Jews and Arab Israelis, Muslim Israelis, Christians. What has Hamas done uh, to <clears throat> protect its own civilians? Yes, they've built tunnels, but to protect the fighters uh, and not the civilians. So if they've taken about six months to a year to plan this uh, this um, attack, they should have planned on how to protect the civilians, knowing what the retaliation would be. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is really heart wrenching to, to to see what what's happening now with the uh, and nothing you've mentioned as well. Um, and I really appreciate uh, in one, your other video where you did lament and and prayed for the civilians, Israeli civilians who died in the attacks, but also the people of Gaza who are dying now. Um, because what what I normally hear are people who are entrenched in either view may have a won't be you know that. Um, uh, inclined to feel bad for the civilians on the other side, but you were different. Uh, you, you treated them equally. Yeah, well, look, you know, there, there are people even pointing out that Israel is doing the civilians of Gaza a favor. They're freeing them from Hamas's tyrant, ty, 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 tyrannical control. You know, and ironically, that's what seems to be happening. Because it seems to me that uh, Hamas has done it quite deliberately. You're asking why don't they protect their civilians? It could very well be it's deliberate because that's how you create outrage in the world. Civilians are dying in Gaza. That way, the moral equivalence between October 7th and the Israelis defending themselves in Gaza, and it could be very deliberate, which would really be even, even more horrible because it's your own people. As you said, the people you're supposed to protect. And if they're using them in that fashion, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I don't know what the end game of Hamas is. If they thought they could uh, unite the Muslim world and destroy Israel, uh, I don't know. Uh, and also, I mean, I mean, the Israelis have, have been well. The IDF has been criticised. Prime Minister Netanyahu has been criticised by all quarters, even the UN, about um, the the retaliation and knowing that there are civilians in the sites where Hamas operated on, and despite the warnings that the IDF gives, which is which no other army gives. Um, despite that, there's still civilian deaths. And I think with the enormous loss of life now there, uh, I don't know what, um, uh, you know, uh, there, is, there is a call for a ceasefire or a humanitarian pause, whatever words we want to use. So at least the medicines and every, everything can uh, can get through. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult one because um, when I listen to these the Israeli uh, advocates, the ambassadors, uh, they ask the question, how are we meant to retaliate? What do we do? We've had uh, a colossal loss of life on October the 7th. We have a right to defend ourselves. What do we do? And it's a good question because if Muslims are faced, or a Muslim army is faced with the same thing, that you're about to attack uh, your enemy soldiers, but you know there are civilians, what do you do? From an Islamic point of view, you can't attack. So I don't know. This is a di dilemma, um, and I know there are a lot of uh, sort of Jewish um, and even Israelis who are criticizing the, the government now. Um, it's a difficult one. Yeah. Well, you know, moving forward, what do you think? I mean, I know we're having this conversation. I think if we many more people had such conversations, there'd be a lot of there'd be hope and there'd be a real future. Yeah. What do you think going forward? I mean. What do you think about this argument? Some are saying that, yes, Israel has the right to defend itself, but the fact of the matter is, due to these images, due to so many civilians in Gaza being killed and hurt, it's just going to enrage the Muslim world even more. And the next generation, even if you eradicate Hamas, there'll be a new generation of haters who will be recruited in the war against Israel. That's, so in other words, the short term, yes, you'll eliminate this evil, the terrorism, Hamas terrorism, but it'll just create more. So I'm mean, just asking, going forward, what do you think? Just your thoughts on how you think this should proceed. I read what you've written, and I totally agree that if we could all embrace the Abrahamic principles, as you said, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, what God wants of us, that would be great. But clearly, we're right now in the middle of a war. 
So just what are your thoughts about going forward? I mean, is this a battle over the schools and the education of the next generation of Muslims that they should gr grow up without that hatred like you did? So therefore they can embrace Islam and find a way, a peaceful resolution with Israel? Well, Rabbi, yeah, uh, I think I think you've you've given the the solution, which is uh, peace. Um, uh, I I wrote uh, so when I when I was in uh, Medina, that's uh, my favorite city, by the way. It's so peaceful, the city of the Prophet. Uh, when I learned that uh, our Prime Minister Sunak uh, had visited Saudi Arabia on the same day uh, to meet uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, I wrote to the aid uh, of the prime minister that to ensure when he speaks with the prince that the Abraham Accords has to be accelerated as a matter of urgency. I've also written to the prince myself, don't know if he's received my letter or not, uh, but I've prayed also that uh, the land of the prophet reaches out to the land of the prophets because that is the solution in the long term. And I think what's been missing, um, and you're asking the question about how do you bring up the next generations, is, is adhering to to do what the Prophet said, adhere to the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about, you know, this has been going on for the last 75 years, et cetera, et cetera. What's been missing, I don't know if you absolutely agree, Rabbi, what's been missing in the last 75 years is, is religion. Are the commonalities between Islam, Judaism, Christianity, uh, the values that Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael had had espoused, that has been missing in the discourse, in the Holy Land. That's meant to be holy, land of the prophets, and we're not even talking about this. It's just fighting land rights, etc. It's um, So I think it's it's really holding on to uh, the words of, of our Creator and having a, a respect for what the prophet Abraham wanted. And when I did engage with some of the uh, pro-Palestinian activists um, to talk about religion, there is some disdain. And I think it's probably because quite a lot of these activists are integrated with the far, you know, with the left, the socialists, who have been traditionally very pro-Palestinian and their, their sort of psychology is by any means necessary. Um, and when you talk about religion, <laughs> you just uh, blown off, you will dismiss. So I think that would be uh, the key uh, it's for future de generations, to answer your question, Rabbi, but normalization it has to be accelerated because when we look at the pictures of children dying, you know, in, in Gaza, we saw the horrible pictures of burnt some families and babies in Israel. When people look at that, those pictures, they have to think, never again, this cannot continue. Either we want peace or we want status quo, which means more killing. Right. So make a choice. So peace has to be the answer. And that's why I think in the short term, the normalization process has to accelerate. And I did tell the prince in my letter um, that he may uh, get a lot of blowback from the rest of the Muslim world because of the emotional connection we have with you know, Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is an act of treason. It isn't in the long run when Muslims, Jews, Christians live under Abrahamic brotherhoods. That is a winner for you know. That's a win for everyone. That's what Abraham would want us to do. What are, you know? What does he want us to do? Well said. I totally agree. Look, um, the problem is, as you know, there's a lot of bad blood, a lot of hostility, a lot of pain mm. that has been caused by all of this. And I, I do appreciate your very balanced tone. I would love to believe that there are millions of Muslims like yourself among the 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. If, uh, if the majority are speaking the way you do, we would have peace. I don't know what's going on in people's hearts and souls. I hope, to, I hope you know, when you hear, and unfortunately we hear this in the United States, the chants from river to sea, um, you know, you hear the, the call for the annihilation of the Jewish people. I think you said it right. This is a holy land, a promised land. Uh, everyone re re reads the Bible, knows exactly what it is. I, I have no doubt, I speak as a Jew, would love to live at peace with every Muslim, with every Arab, with every, for that matter, Christian, with every human being on earth. And I, I just, from my mind, I say to myself, if 
the, 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 if you want to call the terrorists, if the more militant and the more extremists would simply put down their arms and say, we will figure out a way to do this peacefully, as the Quran, as the teachings ascribe, um, I have no doubt that they would succeed. I'm not sure why they feel that the only way is through violence and just creating more hostility, especially after what has happened. I mean, some of the stories and the images that are coming out from, from, from Israel, October 7th, I mean, there's still 20% of the people killed that they can't even identify because uh, they've been so mutilated, and I don't even want to go into the graphic detail. I've seen some of the um, graphics, actually. Um, <clears throat> and um, when you uh, mentioned about the River to the Sea chant, uh, I think this is something unprecedented. I have actually observed many, many uh, pro-Palestinian marches, but this is the first time I'm actually hearing uh, River to the Sea. And obviously this matches, runs in parallel with the uh, charter, the Hamas's charter to drive the Jews out to the sea. And I'm a bit worried about that because it's um, sort of trying to program us, program the masses, river to the sea, river to the sea. It's trying to normalize the uh, elimination of, of the state um, and maybe the, the, the Jewish community, which, um, you know, miraculously, miraculously, miraculously has survived over the last few thousand years. So I'm a bit worried about that, uh, which is why uh, the call for peace, um, the discussions we're having, we need to have more of these. Uh, there hasn't been enough discussions between Muslims and Jews. There has between Muslims and people of other faiths, Christians, Hindus, uh, atheists, brilliant. But this, we are, you know, we are more closely related. Arabs and Jews are literally cousins. Muslims, Jews, Christians are spiritual cousins and, you know, descendants of Abraham. Um, yeah, so I think peace is the only uh, solution. But th there's one thing I'd like to ask you, Rabbi, um, is to get your insight, because, again, you know, this is all, all about information war, isn't it? Um, truth sometimes will be a casualty. In terms of the support for Hamas, I did read in the Haaretz newspaper, the Israeli newspaper in 2019, that Prime Minister Netanyahu did advocate in the Knesset um, that some form of support should be given to Hamas because um, he, because when there's a, a frac, you know, frac, uh, factional um, uh, faction between Hamas and PLA, etc., then less chance of a Palestinian state to exist. So apparently the Prime Minister doesn't want to see a Palestinian state. That's why I supported Hamas. I, I don't know if, how true this is or has there been any investigations? Because if that is correct, this would be treason, wouldn't it? Yeah, I can't I can't speak for, uh, for Prime Minister Netanyahu, yeah. uh, his politics and so on. Also, empowering a terrorist organization that is calling for your uh, annihilation, even if you find some distorted way of justifying that, I think would be uh, completely inappropriate. So, you know, I don't mm. want to blame Mr. Netanyahu for the atrocities, but if he's part of, uh, as well as others that empowered them, um, yeah, that's exactly what happens. Look, I have to say this. Um, I remember the Yom Kippur War, 1973. Right. I remember even the Six-Day War. I was a child, but I remember it. I think that there's a flaw in, uh, in the general thinking of both the Muslim world and the Israelis and the Western world, if I may say so. And that is, you know, if someone declares war against you, you cannot put your guard down and say, oh, you know what, maybe we'll work it out or find political... Uh, yeah. machinations or political considerations. It's a non-starter. I can't speak to you, peace, if you're calling for my destruction or if I'm calling for your destruction. And I think there was like a lull, almost like a wishful thinking. And interestingly, this is a Jewish concept, and you tell me, I believe, I'm sure it's in all religions as well as common sense. If the United, if the Allies during World War II would have said to the Germans and the Japanese, you know, we've already destroyed your countries. We'll give you conditional surrender. Conditional. You know, safe face, have some pride left. What do you think would have happened? The exact opposite. There would have been no peace because they mm. would have used that 
as some type of uh, excuse. And who knows? The interesting thing is, in times of war, sometimes you need to have a very clear winner and loser. You dictate the terms. And look today, Germany and Japan are allies of the United States, of Israel, and so on. So yeah. the idea that someone's calling for your destruction, and mm. you say, I'm going to make believe that's not correct because they're not attacking me today, is mm. a big mistake. So if Netanyahu, Mr. Netanyahu, did what you're suggesting, and investigations should look at it, it needs to be looked at. And I don't, I mean, honestly don't know all the internal politics, what's hearsay, what's facts. The truth is right now, I think, step by step, right now there's a war being fought. Right now mm. there are 240 hostages, yeah. men, women, and children, babies. That cannot be tolerated. There are mm. people who are calling for your destruction. Hamas can surrender if they really feel that uh, they want to protect everybody. Let them surrender, return the hostages, and then we'll sit and talk and figure out. The war will end in a few minutes. Hmm? The war Sorry? will end in a few minutes. Yeah, of course. But uh, they're not doing that because they have their agenda. And unfortunately, it's cost heavy price, this type of so-called complacency. And that should never have happened. I don't want to criticize my own colleagues. I don't want to criticize Israel sure. because right now sure. we have to be united. Yeah. But if you want to look at the bigger picture, it is this is the interesting concept. In the name of God, God says when you're attacked, and you may believe like your attacker is like just another day. You, the expression is that those that will be kind to the cruel will end up being cruel to the kind. And you have to know. Now, I am not, I believe every human being was created by God, the divine mm. image. But then there are mm. people who are proven to be murderers. And what you mm. do to murderers is you either put them in prison or you eliminate them. Simple as yeah. that. And so yeah. Hamas has a choice. And instead of trying to find a, fight a propaganda war and saying, you, we're murderers, you're murderers, and no one's that's really the story. I frankly, if I had my way, I would have a call to all the nations of the world and say, yeah. we live in a world of laws. There is good and there's evil. All the nations, it shouldn't be Israel versus Hamas, it should be the world versus Hamas until Hamas with conditions. The conditions are, lay down your arms, Stop calling for the destruction of others. Release the hostages. And that's that. And that will protect the civilians of Gaza. But they're not ready to do that. I personally, when I see, they're ready. They don't care if all the Gazan civilians die as long as mm. they can prevail and create upheaval and disruption and basically disrupt exactly the Abraham Accords and any peace efforts in the Middle East. I really, that's, yeah. that's, what, it, that's what appears to me. And when you have moral clarity, that's what you see. I know I mm. speak as a Jew, and I'm obviously as a Jew, I have my, uh, I have my, I'll call it my biases. But I don't think I have biases. I really believe that this is the only way you can deal with it. You know, there were people that thought that the Nazis were only attacking Jews, until they saw the Nazis were killing not just Jews. They were killing, homo, they were killing lesbians, they were killing homosexuals, and they were killing uh, gypsies, and they were then mm. attacking. Uh, Czechoslovakia and Poland and innocent people. You know, mm. it's what uh, Winston Churchill said, that appeasement to the enemy is feeding the crocodiles in the hope you'll be eaten last. <laughs> yes, that's right. That, that's a that's a really good quote. And in fact, you were talking about the Second World War and you, you can see the um, the poppy I'm, I'm wearing. Uh, we're we're going to have Remembrance uh, Day this, uh, this weekend, uh, 11th November. And there has actually been some controversy. I don't know if you were if you are privy to what's happening in the UK um, at this moment uh, in relation to the Remembrance Day, um, that there will be a, uh, a rally in a pro-Palestinian rally uh, held on, on the same day. And there's been a lot of controversy. Should it be held? You know, is that going to cheapen the uh, commemoration of the dead in World War Two and World War One? There's some controversy uh, uh, about this, and I, I wish it, it, it didn't happen. Palestine is definitely uh, support the people of, of Gaza. It can be done in a in a sensitive way. Uh, should be done on the same day as as the um, Armistice Day. I don't, I don't know. As long as there's no violence, there there is respect. But I think um, if if they're going to hold the the Palestinian flag, if they want to demonstrate, my advice to them would be fine. You want to um, stand with the people of the civilians of of Gaza. But also have the Israeli flag and stand 
uh, you know, with the victims of 7th of October, have both flags. Those posters uh, of these um, kidnapped people, the hostages that had been torn down, you know, in the UK, in America, hold those posters up during your rally. Uh, the children who've been killed in Gaza because of the bombing hold their posters up. Let that be some unity between all of these communities. You know, the underlying theme of, of the Remembrance Day is never again. You know, the Holocaust was never again. That should be the case now, never again. Let, let all, all people unite. Um, there is one thing I'd like to ask you, Rabbi, um, and and it's it's in relation to uh, as you know um, when it comes to Islam, there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, propaganda. Um, people misquote verses out of context, and they they get a an impression that Muslims are out for jihad to kill everyone. Uh, but obviously, you, you know better. There is also a perception, and maybe that's where I'd like your insights and clarifications from a religious point of view, that when um, the Prime Minister Netanyahu talked about um, the Am Amalekites and the uh, Joshua, son of son of Nun, what the um, re reverberations was that uh, when the Amalekites are discussed in in the, in the book of Samuel, for example, that there was permission to uh, annihilate everyone, including women and children. And my understanding, understanding of the Jewish um, uh, interpretation is this is only a one-off, only God can authorize this. People cannot go and kill people. And you were saying earlier on, you have to defend or protect civilians. So it'd be interesting to know why he made a reference to the Amalekites, uh, knowing what had happened to that community in the retaliation. And they're linking, and the critics are linking that with what's happening in Gaza. Um, so what's the, the religious angle here? I think you're 100% right. Only God can make such reference. And it was only a one-time thing. It was a it was a it was a nation that was like Nazis from beginning to end, and only God can determine. If Mr. Netanyahu um, uh, cited that in this instance, I would say he's wrong. It shouldn't be cited because uh, I would never say, and I don't think any one that follows the Bible, the Torah, would say that the two and a half or two million civilians in Gaza are in the category of Amalek of mm. eradicating men, woman, and child? Absolutely not. I mean, the mm. actions of the Israelis, I think, testify to the fact that they're giving the civilians fair warning and trying to get them out of way of harm of way. And trust me, Israel has the bombing cap capacity to carpet bomb the whole Gaza and flatten it. So I, I didn't hear Mr. Netanyahu's quote, but if he did quote it, like you said, doesn't it doesn't apply to this. Absolutely not. Here, as I said, the situation is quite clear-cut in my perspective. Mm. And I think Mr. Netanyahu and the Israeli government would go along with this. If Hamas lays down their arms right now and surrenders, gives up the hostages, all this stops. Without doubt, without question. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you have to trust them, because if they start shooting the next day, so you need to have safeguards. But it, So therefore, there will not be any more killing of no, no one. It is mm. Hamas's responsibility to protect the civilians of Gaza, and they're not living up, they're not only not living up, they are using them as shields. And that is, in my opinion, absolutely unforgivable. You know, it's unforgivable what they did to the Israelis, but that is equally unforgivable. So that's my stand on this. And no, thank you, Rabbi. I just um, want to add one more thing, Hassan. Yeah. You will not find in history once, besides that story where God talks about Amalek, God, not the people. Mm that mm. the Jewish people ever, I'm not talking about some insane exception as a people, as a community, ever went into any city and killed innocent men, women, and children. It's mm. always been self-defense. Look, after World War II, you don't think the Jewish people were angry? They killed six million of us, one yeah. third of our people, one and a half million innocent children. And when Israel, Israel became a state, did you ever hear anyone say, Let's go bomb Germany in, in out of vengeance? No. Our vengeance yeah. is we build our families, we build our children and grandchildren. And we're not looking for it. We're not, we're not bloodthirsty. We're not warriors. We want peace. 
You only fight because there's no choice. Simple as that. It's the last resort. So I wanted to make that very clear. Mm. I've been asked this question about Amalek many times, and I always say, what God mm. says is God's business. An exception, one exception. But never do you find in Jewish history such behavior. And in yeah, Jesus, it's never I a... Miss, I want yeah. to add one more thing. King David, a great hero by the Jewish people, he fought battles, wars. Do you know what the Bible says about him? No. Even if his wars were justified, and they were, it says, God says to Dave, King David, because you have blood on your hands, even if it was justifiable blood, for whatever reason, due to self-defense or other reasons, you cannot build my holy temple. It will be your son, King Solomon, who, who lived in peace and never went to war. In other words, in Judaism, even when you fight a war, you still cry over the mm. death of your enemies. You still do not you do not worship and you do not celebrate the blood. And as a matter of fact, King David could not build the temple, God's holy temple, because the fact is, no matter what, even in self-defense, it was still blood, and God said the holy temple has to be built by someone that has completely clean hands. And not because King David was guilty. It was because we abhor death. We abhor war. And you only choose it when, when it's forced upon you. And that's uh, that's the story of Judaism. I would like to believe Islam feels the same way. No, exactly the same way. And thank you for that clarification there uh, from a Jewish point of view, because just as people have misperceptions about Islam, jihad, uh, etc. There was some misperception about this, so what we just discussed about the Malachites, and is, is, is whether that's feeding into the current um, operations in, in in Gaza. But thank you for that clarification. I think that was much uh, needed. Uh, and I think when we have these discussions, things become clearer. You know, Hassan, do you feel that there has to be some shift or change in just in general in the education of Muslim children? I may ask you that. Um, I don't know. It, I mean, it depends how they are being educated. Uh, there are well, nearly 2 billion of us uh, around the world. Um, I'm a governor of a Muslim school here in the UK, and I know the curriculum is certainly not <laughs> about uh, killing and terrorism. It is the values, the Islamic values that uh, we're all brought, the common values that we're all brought up with as well as the British uh, curriculum. Um, with all the f families that I've interacted with in my life, uh, I've never come across them um, sort of brainwashing their uh, children about uh, terrorism uh, or, or um, praising uh, terrorist acts. Um, so the education, to answer your question, the education should, should be there. Should there be a shift? Maybe uh, the shift could be uh, in relation to Israel that Israel has the right to exist. Uh, they are, you know, your Jewish brothers. Um, uh, Palestine has the right to exist uh, side by side in peace, so that uh, the the occupied territories uh, will no longer be occupied. The Great Wall of Gaza will no longer be there. They will, it'll come down. They both will live in peace. I think maybe. Uh, that's one answer I can give you in terms of education is, uh, let, yeah, let, let, give give peace uh, a chance. Um, I hope I've answered your question on that. Yeah, no, you've answered. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, do you feel confident and optimistic that there are others like yourself that are ready to join you in solidarity and join, as well as the Jewish people, in a call for peace and civility oh, yeah. especially living up to the high standards that islam expects as just as judaism uh, expects do you feel there is a ability to do that in this climate I, 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 yeah I, I have faith absolutely that this, this will happen i know there's talk about armageddon and uh and there is obviously a belief that's common between jews christians and muslims about uh this big war that's going to the end of times that the moshiach is going to come and uh, and whatnot um Peace will happen, absolutely, when Moshiach comes. And we, we believe in that. Slight variations. We believe in the second coming of the Moshiach, like Christians do. But I, I hope, pray to God, that when he comes, it'll be that one same person that Jews, Christians, Muslims will follow, and he'll be the king of the world, and he'll he'll rule according to, to God's laws. 
uh, before that happens, uh, yeah, we, we can do what we can ourselves. We've got the tools to, to unite. We've got the tools to live together in peace. I mean, for God's sake, the, the halakha, the Jewish law and the Sharia, Islamic law, are so similar, <laughs> you know, um, and our belief uh, in, in, in God is exactly the same. We share the same prophets. What is there not to unite on? You know, that's where that's been missing. The, the religion ha has been missing. And I think religion is is the answer here. Um, I don't mean, you know, Muslims is ruling or just Jews and Christians. What is the commonality? So there's a Quranic verse you will be aware of that says, um, addresses the people of the book, the Jews and Christians, come to common terms between us and you, that we, we worship one God, that we believe in, in the prophets and the books that they came with. That should be the starting point. So there's so much to unite on rather than divide. So I, I, I have faith and I did pray actually, and as I pray for, for peace and I invite uh, people to pray for peace. Yeah, pray for the people of Gaza, those who are suffering absolutely, pray for the innocent civilians in Israel who, who died in the attacks, but pray for peace. That's one big thing that we can do uh, right now. There are other things um, uh, we can do as well, which we have to share um, uh, towards the end. Uh, but I, I, I'm positive, yes, that it, it can happen. Uh, you know, Rabbi, I, I was in Dubai in 2018, and uh, I was doing a video. It was actually in response to some Christian missionaries who made fun of, of the prophet. Um, but I looked towards Israel, okay, from, from Dubai, and I said, the UAE must recognize the state of Israel. There are Jewish brothers here. Let's let's unite. And two years later, they, they did recognize Israel. Uh, I'd... I don't know if the royal family saw my video, unlikely. Um, and I made the same prayer as well very re recently, um, that the land of the prophet reaches out to the land of the prophets. You know, um, why would that be sinful? Why, what, what would prophet Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael want us to do? Beautifully said. So, <laughs> as uh, listen, I can go on and have a long conversation with you longer and we can really cover so many things. I think we cover a lot of ground here. I want to ask you as we uh, wind down here, so what would be your message to the Muslims, to the Jews, to the world, to the West? What would be your message, both in general and also even some practical suggestions? Well, Rabbi, uh, I hope the, the, the message they've heard from us uh, during our conversation is that of hope of peace, of Abrahamic uh, brotherhood, brothers and sisters uniting under under God, because we're here tempor only temporarily, you know. Um, I, I did make a challenge once in, in my uh, book, yeah, the, uh, you mentioned it, United States of Anger, where I re responded to Linda Sarsour in America. Uh, I did say uh, that uh, the Holy Land, well, whatever you want to call it, Israel, Palestine, does not belong to the Muslims. It does not belong to the Jews. It does not belong to the Christians. Who does it belong to? It belongs to God. Instead of so, there should be a mind shift. Instead of us think, debating, do we own the land? The land owns us because we're going to die. We're going to go under the land. The land is going to own us. So let's have that humility, right? Let's go back to the Hashem, the Blessed Hashem, and God. Um, so that would be my uh, advice, is pray hard for peace. That's what needs to happen. Pray for the people of Gaza, pray for the people of Israel who died. And uh, in terms of the practical steps, I made a list here. Um, the gift of charity. So I, 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 I've given to um, uh, the people of Gaza in you know, food, medicine. Please help them. And also I gave to an Israeli charity, the uh, Megan David Adom. Charity, which helps the uh, families of the victims of the 7th of October, okay, um, support each other through through businesses, right? And there's a call to boycott Israel. I think we should do the opposite. I, I visit, uh, you know, uh, North London, where there's a high Jewish area, and the Jewish shops should buy produce from the Palestinian territories, help the Palestinian brothers. And the Arabs who, who own the shops buy Israeli goods, healthy Jewish brothers. Thirdly, um, write to the Muslim embassies, so especially to, to Muslims, actually. Write to the Muslim embassies of the Muslim countries that have not yet recognized the state of Israel, that they need to support the Abraham Accords urgently. We can no longer have this killing that's going on now. Um, and 
yeah so that's that's the the key steps that we can do but ha don't lose faith have hope and let's have more of these discussions and what would your advice be rabbi i second the things you've said the charity um the reaching out I would also add in our own personal lives, because everything in this universe is microcosm, macrocosm, and our own personal lives to bring more light and love and kindness, because a little light dispels darkness, to repair rifts, and to recognize God in your life, recognize God and what God wants mm -hmm. of you. I have no doubt when we're one large organism, if we get stronger in one part of the organism, the rest will also get stronger. In addition, that all the, let's call it toxic and negative elements get exposed when we rise to the occasion and do what we have to do. You know, in a, uh, it's using a physical example, when a body is aching and there's a problem, you want to isolate the infection. You don't mm. want it to infest the entire body. So you isolate mm. by strengthening all of them. And those that don't want to join that will become glaringly visible as being the enemy of the human race. People who don't want love, who don't want peace, people who want to attack, let them be identified as such instead of hiding behind others so then we can identify them. I believe that's, that clarity is critical. So, as I said, I second that. And I think, you know, in Judaism, there are the three pillars upon which the world stands. Study of Torah, which is clarity, getting moral clarity, understanding what God wants of us. Number two, prayer, as you mentioned. And number three, Good deeds, mitzvot, mm -hmm. good deeds. All of us can increase in good deeds. Using technology today, like we're doing now, spread a good word, share share a kind word with someone, even if someone from a different background. So the list goes on. I mean, we have especially dedicated on our website, meaningfullife.com, special section. We call it a mitzvah wall, where you could add a good deed for people of all backgrounds. And um, it's called meaningfullife.com forward slash war in Israel. So you can check it out for many resources. Do you have, Hassan, a place people can reach you or can contact you, a website or an email, anything you want to share? I'm a bit uh, backward. Um... <laughs> okay, that's fine. They can write to us and we'll forward it to you. Okay, that'd be great. Uh, um, I mean, they, they can. Uh, there's my YouTube channel that I have. I don't know if I've sent it to you or not. Um, I'll be happy to say, uh, send it to you. But uh, yeah, yeah if you're we'll getting, post uh, it. Good... We'll post it. But in case, it's up to yeah. you. So look, as I said, this conversation go on. To me, it's a fascinating conversation because this is where magic happens. I don't know if the word magic mm. is the right word. This is where godliness happens. When yeah. people of different backgrounds, you and I, you know, never met before, but it's Abraham that brought us together. <laughs> we both called... Hamas, we call the Muslim world to embrace Abraham. And here we are speaking to each other in this way. And, um, uh, I, you know, we didn't even explore whether we have any different opinions. It's possible we do, possible we don't, but it doesn't matter because you can have different opinions and still um, experience it and communicate with with love and with understanding. Um, but we can leave that for another, you know, there's more to talk, I'm sure there will be. So I want to also keep... Um, keep keep it focused. So I I look forward to have more conversations with you, and I really feel honored to have sat with you together. And uh, we will definitely put it out there and love the people's feedback. Maybe we should conclude uh, since we're talking about prayer. Um, let me say a prayer, and you can say a prayer as well. And uh, uh, the the prayer I'll share is a prayer based on the Book of Psalms, and I uh, the Book of Psalms, King David writes that the Almighty God does not rest and not slumber, shall bring peace and protect all the innocent, all the innocent men, women, and children in Israel, protect all innocent men, women, and children in Gaza and everywhere in the world, and especially in his promised and holy land that he watches over. And may we, the children of God, live up to our legacy, to our mandate, that we were sent to this world. Yes, there's darkness in the world, but we were sent as agents and ambassadors of light to bring light to every corner of the world, kindness, and appreciate the dignity of every life, 
Every life is God's child, God's life. And understand that there's no room for doing anything that's hurtful, violent, mm -hmm. angry. Those are things you have to work on privately that you don't vent in that way. It should be a world that we individually and on the world global level should experience as Isaiah the prophet said, no more evil and no more destruction on my holy mountain because the world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Amen. 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 No, thank you, Rabbi. That's very powerful. And that's what's needed uh, in this uh, dark, dark era. So the prayer that I've uh, prepared, um, so it, it's the first chapter of the Quran, and every Muslim would pray this, uh, start with this for five times a day. Um, so I'll say it in English. So uh, praise be to, to, to God, to Hashem, the cherisher and sustainer of the world, the most gracious, most merciful, master of the day of judgment. Thee do we worship, and thine aid we seek. Show us the straight path, the path of those whom thou hast bestowed thy favor, those whose portion is not wrath, and who do not go astray. And my personal prayer is, is this, O oh Allah, blessed Hashem, please have mercy on the innocent civilians who have died on both sides of the conflict, the children who have died in the most gruesome ways in Gaza and in Israel. May they have everlasting peace in paradise. May Allah, the blessed Hashem, give their parents patience and show them mercy. O oh Allah, we pray for peace so that the children of prophets Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael can live in peace and harmony as they would expect us to do. We pray for the success of the Abraham Accords to unite Jews, Muslims and Christians and people of other faiths so that the state of Israel and the state of Palestine can finally coexist. Let this message of unity, peace, brotherhood and hope spread faster than that of despair and hopelessness. And um, I'll end with... My favorite verse in the the Quran, if I may, Rabbi, sure. I I quoted it uh, during the uh, Conservative Party conference in two thousand and one, just after the nine eleven attacks, and also um, people were not aware of this, but our ex Prime Minister Theresa May, she also quoted the same verse in twenty eighteen at the Conservative Party conference, as obviously the skeptics will think that uh, we're trying to Islamize the Conservatives, we're clearly not, so. I quoted this verse in 2001 uh, uh, for, for everyone, and I think this is a very universal message, and it ties in with your introduction, actually, when you talked about diversity, um, harmony and diversity. And I'll end with this verse, yeah, 49 verse 13. It says, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other and not despise each other. Verily, the most honoured, amongst you in the sight of God is he who is most righteous. God is all-knowing, all-seeing. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you. Hassan, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure and honor. And may our words resonate and shine through the whole world and let us make a difference. Maimonides writes that one good deed, one good word, one good thought can tip the scales and bring personal and global redemption and peace. May that be quickly, speedily in our time. Thank you again. I mean, I mean, it's been a great yeah. honor.